right back up. Right, Mr. You're Emmett? absolutely correct. We have our uh, friends and family here from Webb Elementary School, so come on up to the podium. Awesome. Is there a way to bring down the screen? Magic. Mr. Sutton is oh, Mr. Care Sutton, of that right thank now. you. <clears throat> so, as we're getting that prepared, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to feature the work that we're doing at Webb and that we've done over the past year. My name is Giselle Ziegler. I've been the music teacher at Webb for the past seven years, and I'm here with three of my amazing students tonight, Morgan, Andrew, and Kavia, who I'm so grateful to have here. Um, and what we are showcasing out of Webb's work is the Multicultural Festival that we did in November of 2018. Um, the entire event was free of cost due to generous donations from families, staff members, and community partners. And we feel that it was truly a special event and I am really looking forward to giving you a glimpse into what it actually entailed. So Multicultural Festival, what it ended up being was a celebration of the diverse cultures housed within our school community. And this included one portion of the night that was dedicated to food, research projects, and cultural presentations in our cafeteria and hallways, and another portion of the evening, which you'll get to see tonight, which was dedicated to song, dance, and talent in our auditorium. So the why behind um, Multicultural Festival um, kind of stemmed from a few different things. Um, one of them being um, my personal graduate work on cultural responsiveness and the importance that I found that connections have when they are formed through an understanding of community members and traditions that people preserve. Um, this in connection with seeing in my own curriculum throughout the past few years that when I'm working, for example, with my fourth graders on our folk dance unit or my sixth graders on their world music projects, the amazing investment that the kids have in these types of projects and how they love bringing their home life into school. Um, we've also been having district conversations on courageous conversations, which we were able to connect to this kind of work. Um, and the big thing that resonated for me from there was um, families can feel welcomed within a school, but can they truly feel connected? And that was the kind of question I sought to answer with our work through Multicultural Festival. And I was able to rely on um, several people that I know from the West Hartford Public School System who have held um, successful multicultural events in the past. Um, and that's kind of where the why came from, seeing that inspiration, connecting it to the work that's already being done in Weathersfield. So I'm not going to make you read this, but this is kind of the outline of um, the work that went into planning this event. And I wish, I totally wish I had this list before I went into it, but now I'm imagining these awesome possibilities for next year's event since now all of this is in place. Um, one of the most important connections I made, and her name is emboldened on here, Kim Bobbin. We have such a treasure in her, having her as a family and early childhood coordinator in Weathersfield. She does amazing work. She taught me the importance of going through barriers to work with families and reach them. She's on my role model list, and I'm so glad I was able to take her advice. Um, as a music teacher, I often shy away from data, but I found uh, that using Webb's ELL and ethnic data to prepare myself for what to expect when reaching out to families was very helpful. And when you can get a daydreamer like me working on making mathematical charts out of fascination, you can probably foretell that something kind of weird and unique is gonna happen. And so we were completely prepared for our event. And November 15th came along and all evening activities were canceled due to unseasonably early snow. So my mind was racing and my heart was sinking. I had to make so many phone calls and we had to postpone our event two weeks. We had these awesome cultural institution connections in Hartford that said, oh, sorry, we can't participate in your event any longer. And I felt it would be, I would be hard pressed to have many of our families who had to plan far in advance to be able to attend the event. So I was kind of downtrodden. So, but the perfectionist in me was saying, oh, good, I have two extra weeks to stress about every little detail. 
Um, and this is the picture I had in my head as I was planning it. Where is everything going to be located? And how is setup and cleanup going to work? And how am I going to best communicate with all staff and family and uh, community partners? So this is all very black and white, right? But um, what I think you'll see as we actually move on into what the evening actually looked at, like it was filled with tremendous color and it really brought life into our school. So that brings us to what it actually looked like, which is our first photos from our event tonight. So you can see here on this slide, we're featuring Portugal and the Rodrigues family represented Portugal at our multicultural event. Andrew is here tonight to show you a little bit of what that looked like at Webb. So Andrew, if you'll join us for a Portuguese dance. He dances for the Portuguese Our Lady of uh, Fatima Church folklore group in Hartford. Um, he is doing a partner dance, which is usually in couples, not tonight, but um, it's usually observed during holidays and special events. The prominent characteristics include colorful costumes, um, guitar, accordion, bagpipes, finger snapping, and circular movements. Andrew will show you a brief performance. And three, two, one. <laughs> Congratulations, Andrew. That was beautiful as it was that on the night of our event. Thank you. Awesome. And to get up there and do that. <laughs> so in addition to awesome performances like Andrew's, we featured food, which was cooked by families, as well as massive donations by six local restaurants, which you can see up here. Many people who have never, for example, tried Indian or Greek food are now regular patrons at these um, Weathersfield and Newington establishments. And I've found that one of my favorite aspects of food, uh, life, which is food, has been a great way to forge community partnerships. We also featured um, student instrumental performances coordinated by our instrumental teacher, Mr. Wojcik. He dedicated his curricular time in the fall in his instrument lessons to teaching students folk songs from all over the world. And these kids traveled from booth to booth around web playing what they'd learned and it made the whole experience really magical. We were also proud to partner with the SDMS French Club who went above and beyond in representing France at our event. And looking back, um, this inter-school partnership was one of my favorite parts of the festival. And this brings us to our second performance of the evening. This is Morgan Mealy. She dances for the Griffith Academy of Dance right here in Weathersfield. She will be dancing a light Irish jig. Light jigs are soft shoe dances known for being upbeat and lively. Often on St. Patrick's Day, you will see groups of dancers performing light jigs. We invite you to sit back and enjoy Morgan's performance. Excellent job, Morgan. We're so proud of you. 
So these next few quick slides will hi highlight several of the cultures represented at our festival. And I'd like to really invite you to enjoy the artwork that you see on these slides, um, created by students as facilitated by our awesome art teacher, Ms. Ripa, who worked these projects into her fall curriculum. On this slide, you can see the Ojo de Dios and the butterflies from Mexican culture. Uh, you can see some Japanese origami here with Mrs. Perry and her boys. Um, some kente weaving from Ghana. And several of our students identify with multiple cultures, and we're proud to share this at the Multicultural Festival. I think you can see throughout these uh, slides that our librarian, Mrs. Murphy, and our language arts consultant, Mrs. Jones, worked very hard uh, to find books that were appropriate to represent each country as well. Awesome cookies from Chimeris to represent Italy. I am so sad that we did not get a picture of the food for the Greek booth because we got humongous donations from uh, Mykonos and Village Pizza, which were absolutely tremendous. We actually had leftovers in the staff room the next day and everyone was raving. <laughs> And I'd now like to introduce you to Kavya, who will be giving our last performance of the evening. She is doing an Indian classical dance. It's an ancient dance form. This is known as the Shiva dance, and it's a worship or a prayer to God. Uh, it takes usually about seven years to learn, and Kavya is in year four of learning this dance form. We are so excited to feature Kavya in her Shiva dance. Gate, gate, Kavya, that was tremendous. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. So all in all, there were 17 staff members at Web who contributed to the success of the event. 21 countries were represented at our first Multicultural Festival, and our total attendance um, was 150 on the evening of the event. These are the staff members who contributed in many unique ways to help us put this event together. I'm thankful to each and every one of them. And these are the countries that were represented at Webb's first multicultural festival. Next year, we are looking to expand, and now that families understand what is involved, we hope to be able to spread the word and make next year's festival an even better representation of our Webb community. So thank you, Board of Education. Thank you, students. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. We really appreciate the opportunity to showcase web. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Anybody have any questions before she disappears on us? That was that was just awesome. You know, in our strategic plan, one of our goals is to make global citizens of our children. And I can't think of a better way than exposing them to the cultures of other countries. So thank you very much and for everybody at Web and perhaps it'll spread. That would be wonderful. Thank you. No.
Okay, we'll get on to our rather boring meeting now. I, I can't even say it in another language, but next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for our regular Board of Ed meeting on February 26, 2019. Does anyone see any corrections? Okay, can I have a motion? Motion to approve. A second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Abstain. Those. Oh, sorry. You're Thank abstaining? You. Yes, please. So noted. Okay, thank you. Those minutes are approved. And also on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for a special Board of Ed meeting on February 20th, 2019. Are there any corrections? Michael? Yes, uh, we could please add Ms. Steinmiller Paradise in the attendance. Yep. Well, she was there. She's uh, mentioned later on in the meeting. Thank you. Any others? Okay, so can I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. So noted. Okay. Those minutes are approved. Okay. Um, anyone wishing in the audience to come up to the podium for public comment, may I remind you that you have a five-minute limit. Okay, Mr. Emmett, you have communications? I do, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I wanna first start off by talking a little bit about the uh, railroad reactivation. Mm. Uh, that's been a topic of discussion around town here. Uh, we've been in the planning stages for quite a period of time and it appears that uh, now at some point in April, the line will reopen. Uh, the district will be utilizing the Operation Lifesaver materials to inform students and families. Uh, by Googling Operation Lifesaver, parents will have access to safety tips, informational videos, and instructional materials. Um, we now have staff trained here in district with the uh, Operation Lifesaver uh, curriculum, and we will be conducting student assemblies to get the word out. Uh, from the transportation perspective, our bus contractors have been notified of the restart of train service. And frankly, our buses have always approached the railroad crossings as being live, so the process for them has been in place for years. They approach it, the bus gets quiet, they turn off any type of noise in the bus, the hazard lights go on, they come to a complete stop. They're about 50 to 70 feet away from the uh, railroad crossing. The door opens up, the bus driver looks both ways, and then the door closes and they proceed across. Um, we have put up on our website a link to Operation Lifesaver along with tips for students, pedestrians, for uh, bus riders, as well as bicyclists as well uh, as to how to cross the uh, railroad uh, crossings. Just want to remind everybody that the appellate court session will uh, be happening on Tuesday, April 16th. I got mixed up at the last board meeting. Like, once again, that date is Tuesday, April 16th. Uh, we had a planning session at Weathersfield High School uh, last week, and the appellate court will be hearing two cases, uh, one being a civil case and one being a criminal case. Uh, these cases will be presented at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. in the auditorium, and this session is open to the public. Uh, I do want to make sure everyone is aware the event will occur during the regular school day, so we'll have WHS security working in conjunction with judicial marshals to ensure a safe environment for students, staff, as well as court participants. We'll have more information forthcoming on this event, and the court will be releasing a press advisory <coughs> two weeks prior to the session. Um, I was fortunate to have had been able to attend the spring production of Mary Poppins last Thursday as part of the senior senior dinner. And frankly, I cannot say enough about the talent and the energy that I saw during that performance. Congratulations to students on a brilliant production and thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made that production a reality. The WEC uh, meeting held yesterday right here in town council chambers featured a uh, visit from Generations United who talked about the importance of intergenerational programs and intergenerational programs increase cooperation, interaction, and exchange between people of different generations, allowing for the sharing of talents and resources and supporting each other in relationships that benefit both individuals and their community. Last night's meeting featured a sharing of thoughts and ideas around opportunities that we've established, as well as potential partnerships that connect our senior grand friends, 
as we call them, with our Wethersfield students. Tonight, you'll take action on the 2019-2020 superintendent's proposed budget. Since uh, the presentation on February 14th, the town has requested a shift in utility costs from the board to the town. And the town has also asked that the board absorb the proposed TRB contribution of $249,606. With these adjustments, the board's operating budget for next year will decrease by 2.67%. I want to talk a little bit about graduation. Uh, the office is starting to receive inquiries as to graduation. Um, I s expect to bring the item before you at the next meeting on March 26th. The last day of school for students is currently Monday, June 17th. Um, and as you know, our statute requires that students attend for 182 days, or 180 days, rather. Our calendar provides for 182 instructional days. This does provide us some flexibility on the setting of the graduation date. This, of course, assumes no additional snow days. So it's a little too early to make the decision, but we are monitoring that carefully. So we expect to have that before you on the 26th of March. Um, also want to talk with you a little bit about uh, what is forthcoming with regard to anonymous alerts. Um, the Wellness Committee had discussed anonymous alerts uh, for reporting uh, for parents and students with regard to uh, bullying, uh, self-harm, uh, threatening, or any type of behavior that is um, bothering students either at the high school or at the middle school level. And we've done some research on this app, including speaking with West Hartford and Newtown. And I'm very proud to report that we are looking to pilot this app this year. So uh, my fellow colleagues from the secondary level, um, middle school and high school, as well as our director of special services, Mr. Kazar and myself, participated in a professional development session uh, last week with Anonymous Alert. We expect that um, this app will be up and running uh, within the next couple weeks. And we see that this is a good way for students to be able to anonymously um, report behavior that is risky toward their colleagues. And one of the things that I noted when I talked with my colleague in West Hartford was they are using the anonymous alert app and they have not found a significant increase in uh, reports of bullying, but what they found was an increase in students reporting on peers that were thinking of self-harm. So if this is something that we can put in the hands of our kids as a, as a great resource, it's something we're looking to do. So with that, that is communications this evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mike, uh, John? Yeah, with regards to the, uh, the railroad uh, reactivation, um, I, I know you mentioned something on the website, but more importantly, the new drivers that are driving around town that just don't know how to stop at a railroad track just yet because they haven't had to. Um, you know, it's not going to be going fast, but still, uh, it's a whole other caution area in which they have to do it. So I'm just wondering if they are mentioning that at the high school uh, over their announcements in the morning. Yeah, one of the things that we've done in our website, Mr. Cassio, is we also have a link to the town website. So the town has posted information on this as well. And actually, Chamber of Commerce today also posted right. something. So we're really trying to spread the word out. And I know for us, I already got a hit on Facebook that we had a parent that didn't know. So we're trying to get the message out now. We don't want to make it too far in advance, but we don't want to wait either. Um, I understand from the town website that the town is actually going to be putting up stop signs, like temporary stop signs, to begin to train driver behavior to approach it, stop, look both ways, and then move forward. I also understand from the town website that uh, there will be representatives prior to the line starting up there at some of the crossings handing out um, pamphlets and flyers related to safety. So. Again, we've just got to retrain. And I know myself, I cross those tracks all the time. And I've become very used to just going across without taking a look. So um, from what I understand, there are not going to be any additional gates installed. The, the one crossing we have down on Route 3 is the only one that we'll maintain with gates. Um, so we're going to have to be diligent about that. But good point. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Michael? Okay, thank you, Michael. All right, we have two action items this evening. Chris, can you read action item 6A for us? Sure, I'd be delighted. Um, <coughs> move that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve the adoption policy, approve the adoption of policy 4405, uh, the Connecticut National Identity Services Audit. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion on this? 
It's pretty self-explanatory, Madam Chairman. The, the intent is to, is to ensure the protection of these criminal justice information and its subject subset of criminal history record information until such time as the information is purged or destroyed in accordance with applicable record retention rules. Uh, this is a state <coughs> mandate, and uh, Superintendent Emmett brought it to our attention at the policy committee, and we approved it, uh, and it's had its initial Thanks. meeting. This is, sec I guess, second. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's all there, all, there, all there is. It just goes into all this, the details about uh, retention and proper disposal and all that stuff. So. Okay, so. thank you. Anyone else with comments? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> Motion 6A passes. Okay, 6B, Kevin? Uh, move that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve the operating budget for the 2019-2020 school year as presented by the administration in the amount of $57,159,339. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? I'm discussing it a lot. <laughs> okay. So we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6B, our budget passes. Good. Tonight we do have a presentation of the 2017-2018 Next Generation Accountability Report. Sally, thank you. So good evening, everybody. Um, as uh, previously mentioned, I'll be presenting the Next Generation Accountability Report for the year 2017-2018. Um, so why do we have a state-developed accountability system? So it serves a lot of purposes, you can see on the slide. But um, every state around the nation is required to have some type of accountability system uh, due to the federal oversight of education. While it's guided by uh, state and um, individual towns, um, there is an understanding and research will tell us nationally, depending upon what state you live or where you live within each state, your opportunity for educational access and quality of education differs. So the accountability measures, while they're different across different states, serve, to serve, serve the purpose of tracking progress, um, helping both individual schools and districts make improvements, show where support's most needed, and also recognize success that's occurring. So um, we are lucky here in Connecticut, relatively lucky, that our accountability system, um, what we call now the next generation accountability system, kind of makes me what they're going to wonder, they're going to call it next time when they revise it, but we'll have to wait and see, um, is that our measure here in Connecticut, that I think we're three or four years under this new model, um, is actually um, one of the better states. Um, while it's definitely not perfect, and there are some limitations to it, its, it's uh, spirit is to measure a broader measure of success of students and districts. So if you remember back uh, several years ago to what we call the No Child Left Behind era, where every student would be meeting grade level expectations in language arts and math, and we solely measured success on math and uh, language arts scores. Um, so this is a definite shift away from that for Connecticut to look at larger, um, they have 12 indicators, but actually more than 12 if you count them, um, indicators of success uh, for districts. They're also going to be adding uh, science will come back and also be looking at success for our English language learners in the future. So they're actually going to be adding on to some of these indicators next year. So again, this measurement that we're going to talk today is only one snapshot or one picture of uh, 12 indicators, but it only measures part of the work we do as an educational organization, um, preparing students for college and career and success. Um, well, 12 important indicators of success, um, they're not the only indicators of success that we should look at as we look at our strategic plan and look ahead for the district, um, reflect upon what we're doing well, but also what we can do better. So as I mentioned, there's 12 different indicators. I'm going to just talk about them briefly and then we'll go into an example. I'm going to try and give you a high level um, kind of overview of a lot of complex data. 
Um, and then I can always follow up with you if you have more particular questions uh, later. So um, the first indicator is academic achievement, or what they call the performance index. And so it identifies the students, the percent or number of students that are meeting a proficiency standard. Students that have met a certain grade level expectation as identified by the State Department of Education. The second indicator um, is around growth. And so it looks at grades three through eight, and it looks at growth on um, smarter balanced assessment, for example, in third grade compared to fourth grade and takes those growth scores from fourth to eighth grade and, and looks at that as a, a larger group. Um, assessment participation rate, part of the foundation of this accountability score is that all students are included within that. So to ensure that all students are included in that, there's an expectation that all schools and districts have a participation rate of 95% or higher in all the different categories. Um, indicator five, through 12, with the exception of number 11, are related to high school measures. So we looked at a preparation for post-secondary and career readiness, looking at coursework, um, looking at the exams. Seven and eight look at graduation rate, both, I'm sorry, seven, eight, and nine look at graduation um, on track for ninth grade. So research tells us that students that are on track and have earned five or more credits in ninth grade statistically have a better chance of graduating on a four-year cycle. Um, we have a four-year graduation, a six-year adjusted cohort with the idea of some of our students need more than four years to graduate and they have a six-year adjusted cohort. Uh, Post-secondary entrance rate, students that um, within a year of graduating have committed to a two or four-year post-secondary institution. Um, physical fitness rates, which looks at grades uh, six, eight, ten, um, I'm sorry, four, six, eight, and ten, and students that meet standards on physical fitness assessments and arts access. Um, and then I skipped number four by accident and looks at chronic absenteeism. So chronic absenteeism is defined as students that miss more than 10% of the school year, so over 18 days. So research tells us if you're not in school, you're not hitting proficiency, you're not growing and meet, uh, meeting the expectations in this other area. So one measure of success for districts is to ensure that uh, looking at their attendance data. So um, uh, board members, I'm gonna ask you to um, pull out a paper on the, looks like this, you have a handout looks like this. Um, and it has the district scores. You can use a PowerPoint if that's easier, but I'm gonna talk a lot today about the district scores. And then you also have copies of individual scores. So we're gonna walk through these different indicators and I'll give you a little kind of overview of how to read the chart. And we'll talk about each one. So uh, one, indicator one, again, is proficiency or performance. So number of students that have hit a grade level expectation in the tested grades of grades three through eight and 11th grade at the high school. So one A, um, so indicator one has four different rows, right? One A, which looks at ELA, which is English language arts performance for all students. Um, and then it's one B, English language performance index for high need students. So high need students are students that are identified as special education, English language learners, or qualify for free and reduced meals. So research tells us that um, those students in those groups are statistically uh, what our state calls high needs and they wanna be able to look at that for um, a possible achievement gap. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the achievement gap in another slide. Um, but a, a high focus area of ensuring that all students are successful regardless of your background or your needs. We then have math performance and as you can see this year, um, science is not included because we had a pilot of the new next generation science assessment. On the following year, science will be back included into these scores. So let's look at this first row, 1A. Um, Weathersfield has an index rate of 71.8. Um, so uh, if we look at all those students, we have 71.8 that have met the target. Uh, the target is identified by the state in this particular 1A um, is 75%. So the target is saying, we understand you may have some students that um, have interrupted schooling, um, have special learning needs, uh, English language learners. <laughs> we expect 75% of your school and or district population to be meeting those grade level standards. So for Weathersfield District, we've earned 40 
7.8 points out of 50 points total. So the last two columns are really where uh, you might want our most important columns. So that means we've earned 95.7% of the possible points for English language arts proficiency compared to the state of 90.1%. So in Wethersfield, we believe we should always be above the state average. Um, so that's an example of how to read across the chart. Now, if you look at 1A, all the 1A, B, C, and D, um, proficiency, the state is identified as work at worth a maximum points of 50. But if you look into the second indicator, which is growth, the maximum points are 100. So the state has identified that they feel like growth is worth a greater value of importance. And growth measures uh, what they are defining as a one-year growth for all students as measured by a change on the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And so they expect 100% of the population, because that is the target, 100% of the population to meet a year's worth of growth on this assessment. So if we look at 2A, language arts academic growth for all students, uh, you'll see that our index rate is a 58.7. Uh, so on average, it's a 58.7% of that one year's growth. Um, so we've earned 58.7 points or 58.7% of the points possible. So in 2A and 2B, we actually perform below the state average. We're not meeting our expectations in that area. So for English language arts growth for both all students and high knee students, um, that is our two areas that we perform below the state average, along with indicator five, which is preparation for college and career readiness percent taking courses which includes students that take two or more AP courses in grades 11 and 12, or two or more um, CTE, which is career technology and education courses, and they measure that just in grade 11 and 12 um, for students. And um, number 11, which is our physical fitness um, <laughs> scores, we also perform this below the state average in that one. So that's a little bit about the overview of um, how to read the chart. So we've talked about proficiency, the ones, students that meet that bar. Number two uh, is about the growth area. Four is about chronic absenteeism. Again, you'll see that this is broken down into all students and high needs students. And this is broken down because statistically in Connecticut, our high needs population are uh, more likely to have a higher absence rate. So, um, uh, well, we have really done a lot of work around this and our numbers have overall trended lower over the years. We have 4% of our entire school population that uh, is in this cr chronically um, absent category, which means they've missed over 18 days of school. Mm -hmm. And so roughly that equates to 140 students district-wide in this year that have missed over 18 days. Now, some of those are due to some significant illnesses, uh, family vacations, we do have school anxiety, we have some complex family situations, um, a variety of reasons that all school attendance committees and um, support staff are really looking at to try and engage students within. But it's, it's kind of a powerful number when you think about if you're not coming to school and access to learning, um, we have some complex situations. Um, so let me just kind of go through number five. Again, is preparation for college and career percent taking courses. So we've already talked about that one is the number of students in 11th and 12th grade taking two AP exams. Um, ECE or dual enrollment courses also count or two courses from the career and technology education area. Number six is um, percent of students passing those ex uh, passing exams. So the State Department of Education defines that as students that have met um, kind of their proficiency on either the Smarter Balanced Assessment for reading and math, or on SAT, or on ACT, or have scored a three or greater on AP exams. So they have some different measures they look at for that one. Um, number seven, on track for graduation, uh, which is again, research tells us an important indicator 
We have 94.7% uh, of our students on track, meaning they've earned five or more credits in the core areas in ninth grade, which uh, exceeds the state target of 94%. So for that indicator number seven, we have earned 100% of that points. Uh, we then have some really strong graduation data, and you'll see later on that we don't have a significant gap between our uh, high needs and all students for graduation, so that's some more good news. Uh, number 10 is post-secondary entrance, number of students uh, that enroll in a sec two-year or four-year post-secondary institution, physical fitness, and arts access is a number of students in grades 9 through 12 that are currently in that year enrolled in one uh, dance, theater, music, or visual arts course. Um, so again, there's not an expectation that all students would be enrolled in those courses every year, but within that one year snapshot, uh, the percentage of students enrolled in those courses. So this next slide um, takes the second last column in bold. Uh, bold. So you'll see this in the bold side, 2017-18 uh, performance um, compared to the previous performance of 2016-17. And you'll see some color-coded arrows that red represents that um, this index went down, green represents it went up, and the sideway yellow arrow represents um, that statistically it was greater one, greater uh, or less than 1% of a difference. So statistically very similar in those areas. So you'll see that we have um, some areas that we've um, gone up in. Uh, one of those particular areas are um, the both achievement and perfor performance achievement and growth of our high needs group. So we saw all areas um, with the exception of math remained similar um, going up for our high needs group, which is really exciting news <coughs> as we continue to provide, the, look at our intervention model and provide really targeted learning for our students that need to accelerate their learning. learning. Um, so that was some good news. So this is uh, the second part of the reports that is on the second page of uh, the district reports. So another indicator for Connecticut is looking at what they call gap indicators. So Connecticut has one of the largest achievement gaps, meaning the performance uh, level of students that are not high needs and students that are high needs, again, English language learners, special education, and those eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, there's a distinct difference in achievement, attendance, and these other indicators and performance. So one of the indicators the state uses is to ensure that districts don't have a large achievement gap. Every, I think every, but every district in Connecticut has an achievement gap that we all continue to look at. Um, but those districts that have an achievement gap greater than the state average are, um, are indicated on this report. So this data is for our district report. The good news is we no longer have an achievement gap in math as a district. That's one growth area. Our uh, size of gap column is smaller than the state gap mean um, plus or minus one standard deviation. So as a district, we don't have a gap. You'll see in an upcoming slide, we have two schools that still do have an achievement gap in math. And uh, based upon the accountability structure, they actually drop schools down a category if you have an achievement gap in any of the content areas or in graduation. Um, so that's one thing that we'll be looking at in the upcoming slide. And then the last chart looks at participation. We talked about the importance that all students are included in the accountability results, not just a selected group. And so we want to ensure that our participation rate for Smarter Balanced, SAT, the Next Generation Science Test, all alternative assessments some of our special education teachers take, reaches 85% or above. Um, and so as a district, we've met that. We'll talk a little bit more about that at a, a school level. Um, um, and uh, I know our schools are working incredibly hard on that data. If we don't meet the participation rate of 95%, schools are automatically dropped again down a category, just like an achievement gap um, for different schools. Is everybody with me? It's a lot of information. Any questions before I go on? Good? Okay. 
So this chart shows an overview of uh, the first column is our accountability index from 2016 to 17. We then move into the accountability index for 17, 18. The green arrows represent some good news. Uh, four schools increased their overall accountability index this year. Um, you'll see in the next column that Wethersfield High School did not meet the 95% participation rate for high need students. So let me tell you a little bit about what that looks like as we really dug into the data. We have 79 students that are, um, that are identified as high needs at Wethersfield High School in grade 11 that year. Um, and we looked at the participation. We had four students that were unavailable for some very complex reasons to take the SAT on the SAT testing day and the two makeup days. So because four out of 79% of students were unable or unavailable for learning on those three days, um, we hit 94 point something, and I should know that number, but it's 94 point something. Um, we did not meet the 95% participation rate for high need students. Um, and I will tell you that uh, the team has worked very carefully at high needs, but again, we have some complex situation where students may not be available for accessing tests or learning. Um, and so because of that, Wethersfield High School was dropped down a category um, when you do the math, essentially because one student was unavailable to take the SAT that day. Hard, uh, based on your face, hard information for us to really swallow, but that's really what, what that's about. So Sally, what I would say there then, looking at Wethersfield High School last year, Wethersfield High School was at a level four and was in focus. So Correct. had we met that, and I think it was 94.4 or 94.6 percent as I looked at it. So we had the potential there. If we'd hit that participation mark, we would have gone up two levels from a level four to a level two. Correct. Correct? Yep. Yeah. Um, and historically, uh, the first year this accountability report came out was the first, uh, for those of you that remember, um, originally the state wanted the uh, 11th grade to also take the S back. and we. Um, so initially, that was also because of participation rate. So that was two um, years ago, right? Something in the back. Yeah, so Great. we've, yeah, Kevin. Sorry, could you just quickly uh, tell us or describe the difference between the categories, what that means? Yeah, let me finish this slide and I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that. Yep. Um, so we talked about the importance of an achievement gap. We, taught, we celebrated that the district no longer has an achievement gap in math, but we have two schools, both Webb and Silas Dean, that has an achievement gap in math. Um, because of the way that the categories are identified, Webb would also be a category two school without the achievement gap. So as a district, um, we continue to look at the achievement gap in math. So I want to say, though, that we, we uh, as identified on this assessment, we still are looking at achievement gap in math, but we're still not happy with our overall achievement of non-high needs and high need students in language arts and math. While not identified on this assessment, it's still an area that we continue to work on to improve educational opportunities for all students. Um, graduation rate, obviously for the high school looks great. We talked about that. There is no gap there. Um, and then the last category is um, the uh, school categories. So I think that, well, I think some of this data is helpful. That last column, I think, is the least helpful piece of this whole accountability system because you now take a whole bunch of indicators and a whole bunch of information and work of incredible students and staff and boil it down to a number. So there are category one through five, uh, uh, which include turnaround and uh, um, around focus thank you focus um, and then we also have what we call schools of distinction schools of distinction could be category one two or three but schools of distinction are identified uh, as, as schools in the top 10 percent of the state so we've had Hamner um, has been a school of distinction which means in that particular year growth uh, when they, you take the statewide results of all schools and sort them it becomes a top 10 percent with across the state so schools of distinction will change from year to year and the state has a, a chart that identify cutoff scores so you take your index rate and you can look at a category one a category two a category three um, focus and turnaround schools are identified by the state for some significant changes they want to um, support a lot of our urban schools will be a focus or a turnaround school um, 
so you all received a, cat a chart with all the schools across the state. Um, they're all, every school is classified as a category, and then there's identifications around some subgroups and or distinctions. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And there's a really handy 75-page manual that sometimes I <laughs> dig into to find the answers. Um, it's a complex system, but I think they've worked hard on trying to improve it year after year. So to end this presentation, um, I think that we've you know talked about some areas where we've uh, you know saw improvements. I, I failed to well, I think um, both Highcrest and Wethersfield High School have gone up in categories, and we've recognized uh, their communities, school communities, for that work. Um, so we have some things to celebrate and be happy about. Uh, we have some more work to do in some areas based upon these scores, and as we talk to schools and schools uh, share this out with their, their staff and they bring this to their leadership team, they'll be having conversations about um, what are the places, work we've already done. So some of this information we've received in different forms. So there's already plans in place to really help some of these focus areas already um, as we're getting into the testing season for Smarter Balance and SAT coming up soon. Um, but also how do we reflect upon this and um, think about things we can do differently. So the State Department of Education gives us the four following focus areas to really think about as a needs assessment. And so uh, through administrative team, through school-based leadership teams, through staff, we're in the process of sharing this information, debriefing on it, kind of condensing it, digesting it, pulling it apart because there's a lot in here, and what can we learn from it as we uh, look forward to the next year. Any questions? I have one. Yeah. Um, I have two, actually. Can you talk about the, and I, I get that the, uh, I'm looking at page six, the district report. So I'm looking at the physical fitness numbers, and it looks mm -hmm. like there's a difference that is like greater than like 5%. In, and I know you're looking at a different subset of students based on their, but that seems pretty big. Do we yeah. have any idea of what's contributing to that? So physical fitness is really an interesting area, and um, I know we're having individual conversations at schools. Um, it is, um, you know, administered um, by teachers, and um, the State Department of Education note they used to have a physical fitness and health and wellness coordinator that would kind of help coordinate some of this work. Um, they no longer have that with cuts. Um, so I think it's a, an area that I don't have a quick answer. A lot of our, our curriculum doesn't necessarily, uh, so our, like in language arts and math, I would say our curriculum is a primary area that students are learning about language arts and math with support from home and other extracurricular opportunities. Physical fitness, um, our curriculum is not structured to just teach physical fitness as far as some of the strength and stretching. Um, but it's also a measure of overall health and wellness of a community and a school. Um, so it's definitely a more complex measure that um, I don't have a simple answer for you. I think I have in my head the same questions you have that we're having the conversations at schools. And I wonder why our scores are below state average. Um, and I don't have the quick answer for you. Yeah, it just seems like there's a lot there. Yeah, it's complex. Year year seems like yeah. Crazy. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And I have one more. Um, so in terms of the achievement gap in math for Webb and Silas Dean, the contributing factors, I mean, is it, how big is the gap? Is it a little bit? Is, it, is there anything contributing to that? And I know you're digging in at the school yeah. level and all of everybody's, but I just wanted to get an idea of what that looks like because it's a little fuzzy for me. Yeah, so I think that um, we continue to look at both proficiency and growth of our students. Um, I think that we have a stronger intervention model at the elementary level because we have um, had more grant opportunities and tutors. I think that uh, supporting the SRBI or intervention model at the middle school, they now have a math tutor this year, um, but the need to provide more structured intervention for students uh, that are identified and have the resources to support that learning within the classroom, I think is something we continue to talk about and how can we do that at both the middle school and the high school, when we look at intervention and SRBI. Um, you know, I think we see some good growth in uh, some of our other areas for high needs. So I think the idea of how we use data and how we look at student data and how we help support them shows some positive effects. 
Um, some resources to support student learning, I think, is a, a piece that we'll be talking more about. Um, and also, how do we structure our, our curriculum to be able to meet the different needs within the classroom? Um, it's a continued, um, it's not, not new, but I think the work we're doing um, at the secondary level. Yes. Okay, John? anyone else? John? What's the source data for this? Where, does, where do these numbers get generated from? Yeah, so it comes from a lot of different places. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the manual, um, uh, every indicator, they have a really nice job about laying out a page, and they talk about the why they have this, how they measure it, what does it mean, and they have a source indicator. So a lot of it comes from district reports that we're required to submit to the State Department of Education, like attendance and courses that students take. Obviously, the testing data they have as part of their um, state contract with testing, um, but a lot of it is reported through district reported. There's a lot of, there's a, a laundry list of state reports that we must provide, um, and so they take that and analyze that across schools and districts. I think the other thing to consider when you look at this and you look at the district, I mean, I'm sorry, the statewide list of schools is that every school has different structures. So there are some schools that are K through three schools and they only measure this really, a lot of these indicators are only measured by one third grade group, right? So if you have three classes of third grade students, um, it's a different number of population of students compared to a school that's K through six, compared to a school that's, you know, some schools are just sixth grade, some schools are five through eight, you know. Different structures um, allow data to look a little bit differently depending upon your population, small school versus large school. Um, I don't want to say that's good or bad. I think that when you look at the categories, you also have to understand some background information about the school and the, the grades it serves. Any other questions? <coughs> Anyone else? I, you know, Sal, you may have said it. I didn't hear it. About the science performance indicator or index, when is that going to be available? Like, not, they haven't changed... Yeah, so um, this, this current year, we'll be taking the science, new science assessment in grades that, 5, 8, and 11. Um, so on the 18-19 accountability report, um, that will be presented. In addition, they're um, adding both proficiency and growth for English language learners. So we'll have science added, but also another category for our English language learners. Um, given the large number of uh, students across the state of Connecticut. So we'll see those added in the future also. Okay. Okay, thank you. Then I was also looking at, um, in our indicators, you have H, and a lot of our learners are English learners, English language learners, and um, we went up in most of the categories for high-need students. Yeah. So that's, yeah, um, that's commendable. Very yeah. nice. I think that's the payoff. We've added two certified ELL teachers mm -hmm. over the past two years. And when you have that level of support in your schools, uh, it's nice to be able to target that. I would certainly, you know, as we wrap up this evening, like to recognize our administrative team that's here um, with us this evening. These um, data pieces went live on, I think it was a Friday morning, and we sent it out uh, to the administrators and they immediately dug in. So they're working with um, their teacher leaders in each building to talk about um, areas of growth, um, areas of success, and there is dialogue that's going on among the schools. So when you see these schools that have demonstrated some really strong growth, what are they doing? So we're not trying to do this in silos and in isolation, but um, again, for our administrators, thank you for being here this evening. Yes, uh, thank you. Ms. Bannon, we understand you know, you're joining us from New Haven. Uh, your, your school in New Haven went from a level five turnaround to a level three, am I correct? It did, you thank you. Correct. So we're looking forward to similar results here in Weathersfield. Let's get that sound. <laughs> oh, no pressure, one. no pressure. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, administrators. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Yes, thank you. Any questions? Great. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. You could actually spend hours on those things. Okay, so Board of Ed meetings held. We had our Policy and Planning Committee. Chris, you want to speak to that for us? Not particularly, but I'll, uh, I'll okay. fake it for a while. Wait uh, yeah, we, uh, like I said, the uh, recently adopted uh, procedures for the criminal justice records uh, was one piece of work, and uh, we continue discussions on uh, cell phone policy, which um, uh, Principal Moore was able to provide some uh, insight into in terms of uh, punishment and structure, which we may, we've come up with some ideas. That we, I'm going to also send that around 
Uh, I have some other uh, additional thoughts on uh, the type of policy I think we should have, or at least discuss, bring to the full board for their for their uh, review and action. Uh, obviously, this is something that we have a little time to do, so figuring if we do adopt a new policy or an amended policy, the policy that we have, uh, that would happen. We'd have enough time to uh, prepare staff, obviously, going into the uh, next year. So that's what we're working on. Yep. You have a timetable? That, that and the usual avalanche of state mandates that come down, filtered through <laughs> Superintendent Emmett for us to, uh, to move through the process. Chris, you have a timetable on this um, cell phone policy? I would like to get it uh, done no later than the end of maybe next month, mm -hmm. if we can do that. I think we can. Yeah. yeah. Should be able to. We'll give you a call. Yeah, we'll give you a call, but, call. You, only, but you can't have the phone on when I call you, so you're going to have to get back to me. You just have to get back to me on that. Any, any questions for Chris? Give him a call. Any questions? Okay. We have Finance and Information Management Committee. Kevin? Thank you, Madam Chair. And if you don't mind, we could add um, this, this special Board of Education budget sure. workshop as well, because it was kind of uh, reiterating the same points we went over, kind of going through the administration budget. Um, the final piece we voted on today is, is before everyone. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with some uh, shifting from the, from the board to the town and the town to the board, which, which where we come up with our 2.67% decrease. Um, and one thing I kind of wanted to reiterate is that, you know, the, the board uh, portion of the budget did increase on only under 1% of that increase is, um, is outside of a contractual obligation. Everything else is we are either a state mandate or we're contractually obligated to pay. I just wanted to make that point um, crystal clear. Okay, any questions for Kevin? Uh, just to commend him for his leadership on the budget along with the staff. Uh, you know, 50, we throw numbers around $57 million is still a lot of money. Uh, and the people of this town obviously work very hard to support our schools, but I think the budget uh, is a very good one, and it speaks to the cooperation going on with the town, to given back and forth with uh, through uh, superintendent's efforts and the, and the town manager and the new town manager's efforts. So um, I'd like to just commend those who did all the hard work on it. Okay, anyone else on our budget? Thanks, Kevin. Um, well, Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, or WEC, met yesterday, March 11, 2019. We met right here um, for a special um, meeting. But to tell you, the mission of WEC is that all our Weathersfield children, birth to eight, are healthy, developmentally successful learners and connected to the community. And so last night, the Liberty Bank Foundation, Generations United, um, and WEC put on Generations United presentation. Michael was there, Sally, TC members, our mayor, new town manager, and myself, with many other groups and organizations came together. The presenter was Donna Bitts. She's the executive director of Generations United, who gave a most interesting, informative, and at times heartfelt presentation on how much stronger community can become when generations, our old and young citizens, cooperate, interact, and support, and communicate. I believe our hope going forward is the establishment of an intergenerational committee to bring all ages together to impact Weathersfield in many positive ways, because as they said, we are stronger together. All right. Is there any unfinished business from the board? Okay. So is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that you have a five-minute limit. Okay. Any board comments? Madam Chair. Ginger? I'm a swim mom. We all know this. So I have to congratulate the boys of the Weathersfield High School swim team who came in fifth in class M last Ooh. night and uh, to encourage them to keep swimming fast at the state open on Thursday evening. Great. Great. You know, you mentioned phys ed too in, in our um, index scale and I, I have to say we have seemed to have such fabulous athletes uh, in grammar school, middle school and high school. You wonder what's wrong with those numbers. I don't know. Okay. Maybe okay. it's a math error by the state. 
Can, Can I you make a quick comment too? I'm sure. Sorry. Go right I ahead. I wanted to congratulate our very own student rep for getting her license. Um, she posted it on Facebook and we're friends, so I'm very happy. Make sure you stop at those uh, train yes. tracks. And uh, congratulations. Congratulations. That's great. Okay, anyone else? Well, I have some closing comments. There was the um, Wethersfield Hunger Action Team met on Friday, March 8th, and there was a discussion of the April 27th hat walk at the Dunkin' Donuts Park from 8 to 1 o'clock. Please consider being part of this wonderful food fundraiser. Um, you can get more information from the Food Share website. Also, Corpus Christi School and Max Bebo are the May Dazzling Dozens as they will be collecting food goods all that month. The Silas Dean Middle School finished their March Madness food drive by collecting over 500 food items. I do believe, I hope I have this right, the seventh grade won and now get to watch NCAA games at lunch. I think I have that right. And the next um, food fundraiser they have is Spread the Love. And they will be doing that in the month of May. They'll be collecting food items for peanut butter and jelly. Don't you love that idea? And how great they are. Finally, the Food Share Hat Symposium is April 25th at the Crystalis. It's a great event to see what other communities are doing to fight food insecurity. The Weathersfield Education Foundation had a meeting on Thursday, February 28th. Their focus is on the fundraiser on April 25th by Gina Barreca, speaking on Growing Up Italian. We're going to be global citizens. And please consider going for a most entertaining speaker and a great cause. Info is on the school website. Um, very interesting. The Career Advisory Board put on a Lunch and Learn for our high school students, and all of these are an opportunity to listen to and ask questions of an individual in a career of the student's interest. On Thursday, February 28th, State Attorney Michael Gaylor of the Judicial District of the Middlesex County spoke to the students and explained his job and the work he does with the forensic lab in Meriden was most interesting. Attorney Gaylord also sits on the DNA Data Bank Oversight Committee, which is the forensic science behind much of his work. Annie Dillon, Christina Harris, and Mark Danaher organize these Lunch and Learns for our students um, as an activity from the career, um, the Academy Career Board. And finally, Ginger McCurdy and I attended the Colonial Museum created by students in Nicole Antonelli's class at Charles Wright, where the students did all the work and with the docents of their displays, a great start as the schools implement our new social studies curriculum. And thank you for inviting us. We love invitations. So if anyone else has a comment or let's learn about life at the high school, Eden. Thank you. Good evening. So I was going to piggyback on the Michael Gaylor event. Um, I also attended as I'm considering minoring in forensics in college. It was a really fascinating event. The speaker was phenomenal. It was very fascinating. Um, I also attended the senior night for Mary Powell's and Mr. Emmett. The, the show was wonderful as always. Um, they really do a phenomenal job over there and we really are blessed with a wonderful drama department. And lastly, um, we'd like to welcome Tara Yusko as the new assistant principal at WHS, and thank you, Mr. Cavalieri, for all you've done. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Eden? Great, thank you. All right, at this time, I make a motion to move to executive session for the purpose of discussion of pending litigation, Anne Marie Berrios versus the Weathersfield Board of Ed. And I have a second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that concludes the public part of our board meeting. Thank you all for coming and for watching, and the board wishes you all a good night.